وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن من به فارسی نکتر میگم خواهر را امروز بازم قرآن خوانده شد متاسفانه طرف خواهر را خیلی حرف زدن بود ای کاش که آمدن به این مکان که هدف ما انشاءالله ای است که ثوابی ببریم هدف ما ای است که از معنویت بهرمنشیم با گناه چون گناه است وقتی قرآن خوانده میشود حرف زدن بی توجهی به قرآن ولو یک طفل و یک کودک قرآن بخواند یقینا بی حرمتی این قرآن است انشالله عزیزان بیشتر توجه داشته باشند الحمدلله ما که بالای منبر آمدیم همه سکوت کردند الان نمیدونم از لطف شما است که احترام و حرمت سخنان را نگه میداریم ولی خواهشان قرآن که خوانده می شود کلام وحی است کلام خدا است انشالله با سکوت خودتون حرمت و جایگاه قرآن رو حفظ بفرمایید بر محمد و اهل بیت محمد صلوات اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم لا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلی العظیم الحمد لله الذي جعل الحمد مفتاحا لذکره و سببا للمزید من فضله و دلیلا على آلائه و عظمته ثم الصلاة والسلام على خیر خلقه و حبیبه حافظ سره و مبلغ رسالاته حبیب اله العالمین و خاتم النبیین ابو القاسم المصطفى محمد و علی اهل بیت الطیبین الطاهرین المعصومین سیما بقیت الله فی السماوات والارضین قال الله تبارک و تعالی فی القرآن الكریم خلق الانسان من عجل سأريكم آياته فلا تستعجلون صدق الله العلي العظيم illuminate your hearts and minds with the remembrance of the Prophet and his family with the salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad In Dua Arafah there is a phrase that I want you to think about and contemplate I recited tonight in the Qunut of the Maghrib prayer. Dua Arafah is on the ninth of the Hijjah. Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam recited this dua, which is a bit lengthy and long, but is very profound. If anybody is in looking for a way to deepen their understanding of Tawheed and monotheism, to increase their recognition of of Allah subhanahu wa taala, for sure. Read Dua Arafa of Imam Al Hussein Ali Salam with its translation, of course. It's a bit long, so if you cannot do it in one sitting, divide it to a few parts and read a few pages or one pages at, at a time. And the word Arafa itself comes from Ma'rifat, which means recognition, knowing. And on this dua, Imam al Hussein introduces Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a very complex way that who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, how we believe in Him. And one of those statements is this that He made this request, this dua. And I wish we learned that from Imam Hussein. Because sometimes what we're asking for is like, you know. Many of you are familiar with you know, children's stories, right? Genies and three wishes. Imagine that if you make a dua, we don't have a lot of time, and usually we're in rush. And what we're asking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is usually comes to our priorities, what we ask for. So like those three granted wishes. And look at Imam al what is what is he asking for? It's a good example to replicate. The first thing Imam Ali Salam said is, Allahumma ja'al ghinaya fi nafsi. Oh Allah, make my satisfaction, my fulfillment to be 
from within me to be in myself. Ghina is to be satisfied, to be enriched. And that's why Ghani is a wealthy person, that somebody has no financial needs. But Imam is making a very important dua. Imam is asking, Ya Allah, don't make my satisfaction to be dependent on external matters to come from outside. Because sometimes I feel that I'll be fulfilled, satisfied if I have something, if I own something. Let's say if I have a car, if I have a job, if I'm married, if I have children, these are going to make me ghani. These are the matters that make me fulfilled, satisfied. And Imam says, this is not going to truly satisfy anyone because these external entities are temporary and they're more to even own. So Ya Allah, make me to have that fulfillment from within. You know, these are similar statements that I've seen young people talk about Buddha's quotes and, you know, Dalai Lama's, what he said, and, and all these inspirational, motivational speakers saying similar things to invest in yourself and to work on yourself. Imam al Hussein du Arafah, he said it absolutely in a very phenomenal way that, Ya Allah, make my enrichment to be in myself. Imagine if you make that dua, that Ya Allah, if I have something, of, if I don't, I'm fulfilled. You know, that's the statement of Zainab Salamu Alaiha. When she said, you know, that in a famous sermon, there's a phrase that all of us, we heard that, right? But to think about it, what it means. Ma ra'aytu illa jamila. I saw nothing but beauty. What it means? It means the one who's true enrichment come from within it doesn't matter if you're comfortable in medina sitting with your brothers if you're with your husband and children or you face all that calamities in the karbala at the end of the day you're fulfilled you know your mission you know the purpose you see where the goal is everything is beautiful that difficulty is not going to be a defeat Imam Hussain said, Ya Allah, make certainty to be in my heart. So last night we talked about the topic that what's the purpose of religion? Why religion matters? It's a good question. But usually when we ask that question, we are in a state of doubt. We're a shak. And it's again normal as a human being to question ourselves. You know, there are moments that even prophets of God ask Allah for a sign. Like Ibrahim alayhi salam. We have in Surah Baqarah, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a sign. Ya Allah, show me how you revive the dead. Even a prophet of God is in a level said, I have iman, but I want assurance for my heart. But to stay in the stage of doubt is destructive. If somebody believed that there is no certainty in reality, there's always is only a skepticism. There is no real solid fact. Everything is relevant. Everything is relative, is not certain. That itself is a very difficult life to live. Imagine that. A life without yaqeen is not an easy life to live. That's why, you know, people who always, they question their decisions, right? They're hesitant. They're not good leaders. You cannot even run a good business. Forget about religion, right? That if you're always questioning your decision. Eventually, after all the contemplation, you have to make a decision. So Imam Hussain is asking, Ya Allah, Allahumma ja'al ghinaya fi nafsi wal yaqina fi qalbi. Help my heart to find that certainty, that calm. I don't want to be in tribulation all the time. وَالْإِخْلَاصَ فِي عَمَلِي Ya Allah, help me to find sincerity in my action. وَالنُّورَ فِي بَصَرِي Ya Allah, give light to my eyes. Because there are, you know, moment of darkness, confusion. Allahu waliyu alladhina amanu yukhrijuhum min al-dhulumati ila nur Allah is the guardian and the guide to take people out of darkness to light. So Imam Hussain is asking, Ya Allah, 
give light to my eyes. Wal-basirata fi dini. That's the last night topic. Ya Allah, grant insight to my religion, to my understanding of religion. Don't make, don't make me a superficial religious person. Help me to be among those who understand religion properly. The way it was meant to be understood. So, ultimately we answer that question, that the re religion is relevant, is not outdated, because what religion, specifically Islam, is trying to address, is to offer a solution to the diseases of the soul. Islam, when it comes to the matter of dunya, encourages motivated people to study and seek knowledge. So in the matter of universe, look at the oceans, look at the stars, look at the animals, you can see my signs of power in all of them. In the creation of the earth and heavens, and the alteration of day and night, there are signs for the possessors of intellect. So that is the part that religious said, go on the matter of dunya, figure it out. But what religion offered is a cure for the soul. Yes, materialistic aspects of dunya is changing, evolving. You know, the way that we live, our houses, the way we utilize energy are not the same anymore, right? We try to be more efficient. Somehow we try to be much more, uh, at the same time, green in producing these energies. But at the end of the day, while all these advancements provide us comfort, you know, right now, the way we live, what we have access in our kitchen, 100 years ago, you need a full staff kitchen to provide what you can do in your apartment with your small kitchen. So we advance in comfort level. We don't need to go and collect, you know, woods for fire in order to make something and to bake something and to cook it. As everything is much more convenient. That is changing. And Islam never said, come to me for that. Never Allah in any verse of Quran said, I'm going to provide that for you. It was never the case. And instead what Allah said, come to me. Allah said, Ala If you're looking for peace, if you're looking for tranquility, come to me. Allah says, religion says. Comfort, you can gain it in dunya. Look at the time of Musa alayhi salam, right? Even religions before Islam, the religion of Musa, Isa, all the prophets of God, none of those religions provided comfort for the prophets of God. Musa alayhi salam is not living a comfortable life in comparison with Fir'aun, right? Isa alayhi salam and all the other prophets of God, they're not having a very comfortable and easy life. They don't. What they have instead, they have that peace of mind, peace of heart, tranquility. That no matter who are they facing, what Musa alayhi salam is asking Allah, Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri. Ya Allah, expand my chest. Increase my ability to endure difficulties. If you don't, we don't know what is expansion of chest, you know, we have a teacher explain this very easily to a child. He said, okay, get this cup of water and put a spoon of salt and dissolve it in this cup. Now try to drink it. And the child said, no, this is too salty. I can't. And then he gave him a jar. So okay, now mix this one spoon of salt with this much of water, with a jar of water. And the student said, so now try to drink it. I said, okay, that's more doable. He said, that's what sharh al sadr is. That's what expansion of the heart is. That the difficulties, the, the wider, the bigger your soul and heart is, the difficulties are not as difficult to tolerate, to endure. Rabbi shahli sadri. So religion is providing that spiritual aspect, expansion of soul. So those are not changing. As I mentioned, if you look at the first story of Quran, is the first story of mankind, is the story of Adam alayhi salam. 
what caused Adam alayhi salam to end up on earth? What was it? That demotion was caused by what? Greed. Allah said, Musa, uh, Adam and Hawa alayhi wa, Allah gave them everything and asked them not to approach this tree or that forbidden fruit. But greed and shaitan's temptation led them to that. That disease still till this day exists, greed. That's why religion is still is relevant and is still matter and is not outdated. Because religion is supposed to offer a cure for greed. The teachings of a religion is about to deal with it. When we have khums to be wajib, zakat to be wajib, to give sadaqah, to be generous, to be inviting, to be hospitable, all that is part of the teaching of religion is to fight against greed. Then we come to a story of two brothers, Habil and Qabil. They kill one another, one kills the other. Qabil kills Habil, right? Why? Jealousy. Is that disease still relevant? Does it, does it still exist? Is rampant. Jealousy among people, unfortunately, I've seen couples who are jealous of each other's success. Siblings who are jealous of one another. So the disease is still is here, is not cured. Islam is here to cure that. Then we come forward, there are other diseases that Quran refers to them. When it comes to lust and shahawat and desires, lowly desires, carnal desires, when it comes to anger and hatred, all of them are still relevant. So Islam is here to offer a cure for them. My brothers and sisters, these diseases, they were unfortunately intensified. Much more, you know, and, and severity got worse than ever. Social media did not help these diseases, made them worse. Technology made it worse. In the past, if somebody was hateful, they should go somewhere, talk to someone, backbite, gossip, ghaybat, or indirectly insult someone to, object, to achieve their objective. Right now, technology make it much easier to do that. You're anonymous sitting behind a computer making a hateful post be insulting, you know, destroying their reputation, all with a video, with a picture, with a statement. So technology in some cases made some of these diseases to be much more widespread. Jealousy, thanks to posting, sharing, you know, our, our happiness, our enjoyment, our celebration, our photos, our anniversaries, what happened? Did we help with jealousy? Or literally we add fuel to the fire of jealousy in some cases. So these are the diseases that religion is here to cure. Quran is the shifa. Prophet Imam Ali salam called him tabibun dawarun bi tibbi. Prophet Imam Ali describes him as a doctor who was a mobile doctor. He was walking around, dealing with people, offering them cure to their issues. Of course, it's not, he's not an MD doctor. You know, there are, even at the time of the Prophet, there were Jewish doctors who were practicing their skills and, and their profession at the time of Prophet. But what kind of a doctor is Rasulullah? Shifa'un lima fil sudur. He's the one who offers the cure for our humanity. Humanity is dying without the guidance of Allah. Physically, biologically, we're alive. But spiritually, there are people who are dying because of these diseases. That's why Imam Ali Asam refers to some of these men. Ya ashbahur rijal wa la rijal. O shadows of men, but you're no men. What's the cure? I'm going to talk about one of them. I'm going to talk about the master key. This is, let's call it the anti-diseases of the soul, the major one. The ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran talks about this. And we know about this surah, all of us. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات everybody said with me وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر the last word of this surah is the word الصبر patience the cure of many of these diseases is development of patience forbearance حلم Ability to endure and tolerate challenges. That's the topic of tonight. For a short amount of time, what is the meaning of sabr from the Islamic perspective? What, in what aspects of life we need this forbearance and patience? What is the admired sabr and what is the criticized sabr in our religion? What are the ones that there are Condemned in Islam, the type of patience that is condemned, and there is a type of sad that is condoned. Which one is it? And lastly, how we can increase our sabr, how we can develop sabr. So starting with the word as sabr, in Arabic language, it says they come from two possible roots. One is that the word sabr comes from a type of roots, which is from Yemen, which is a very bitter medicine. Very difficult to swallow. But the benefits are abundant. So something that is very difficult to consume, but has a lot of good benefits. And patience, it has that impact. An ability to endure suffering for the sake of greater benefit. Imam Ali salam beautifully described it. Rasulullah salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Imam Ali alayhi salam defines sabr as this. That when it comes to sabr, there are two pieces to sabr. One is at the time of musibah, calamities, not losing control. Not letting emotions take over your decisions, your words, your action at the time of challenges and difficulties and trials of life. Second, ability to control your anger at the time of wrath. These are what the meaning of sabr is. One is our threshold of endurance and tolerance. Another is anger management. This is sabr. And when we talk about sabr, in Quran, one of those greatest rewards that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised are for the patient. Allah said in Quran, this is in one place in Quran, Allah said that we reward people without measurement. Hisab. Imam Zain al Abidin narrated in the Day of Judgment, there are a group of people who come toward heaven and they're being asked that you arrived so fast, did you halra'aytum hisaba? Didn't you face questioning, accountability, measurement, reckoning? And they say, Qala la, no, we didn't. Hal ra'aytum sirata, did you face sirat and the criterion and decision? They say, no. Said, how is that possible? Everybody have to face it. And they say, look at the Quran. Nahnu sabirun. We are those in dunya, we were patient. We are those that you call, you call us sabir. And Quran clearly said that. Those who are patient and sabir, their reward will be compensated without measurement, without hisab, without reckoning. It's a promise of Allah in Quran. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Allah is with the patient. So I can, you know, go over so many verses in Quran that Allah talks about sabr. Why is it? Because sabr is not something that we were born with. It's not something that we had. It. We have to attain it. We have to practice it. It's like knowledge. You know, we were born without knowledge. مِن بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الشَّيْءَةِ Quran said, you were born from your mothers without knowing anything. You have to attain ilm and knowledge. Sabr is the same. Quran said, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ عَجَلِ we created man from ajal, haste. 
impatience, rush. سَأُرِيكُمْ آيَاتِي فَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ Soon, I'll show you my sign. Don't haste. Don't rush. كَانَ الْإِنسَانَ عَجُولَ Quran said. Human being is very hasty. Look at children and look at some adults as well. Everything is about, can we do it as soon as possible? In every matter of life. And I remember I asked, a student in Saturday school, what do you want to do? Some of them, of course, in the past, I remember there were people who said, I want to be a pilot, or I want to be an engineer, or a doctor. The answers of this generation is not that easy. What do you want to become? I want to become a YouTuber. What else? I want to make a lot of money in shortest amount of time. I want to be famous. It's not their fault. This is what they're being exposed to. And some of the high school students ask them, what do you want, what do you like to major in? You're in last year, you're a senior in high school, you should eventually get an idea. So to be honest, I'm looking for a type of education that I can just finish in two years with the associate degree and make a lot of money. Going to school, undergrad, and then middle course school and res. The impatience, unfortunately, is more, much more widespread than we know. And one of the reasons for that is the culture that we live in. The culture that we live in is culture of instant gratification. What is instant gratification? People are looking for actions that has immediate result. You want to play a game that suddenly gives you some kind of reward, whatever that is. Give you bonus, increase your rank, give you a new accessory, new gun, whatever the game is. There is a compensation. And they kind of, you know, they have their hook on. That as soon as you're in, without knowing, you, you spend hours and hours and hours playing. Same is with, you know, social media platform. It's about the number of likes, number of interactions, comments, it become a job. You know, I was traveling with a brother. We had a group of youth and shabab in California. We went for camping. I felt so bad for this brother. The entire trip, it was like a daily task to post stories on Instagram. I, I, honestly, I've seen people spend less time caring about their homework. It's so like a job. What are you doing, brother? Staying awake at 11 p.m. Everybody's going to bed. You know, let me just go through my photos. I'm going to post the stories. And this is not, that person is not evil or bad or ignorant. No, it's, it's a culture. That's the power of culture, by the way. That we do things without even thinking. Without even questioning why I do this. It's acceptable. Everybody does it. If I don't do it, I'm the weird one. I'm the awkward one. I should be like others. So we live in that culture. The culture of impatience. We want immediate result. As soon as possible. You know that study that, again, is not actually about attention span that people think. I've heard it, some speakers even say it, that the attention span of people and young people now is less than a goldfish. It's not true. It's not the attention span. It's a study done by Microsoft. It's about how much time someone will stay on a website on average. It's around eight seconds. When you're going to one website, that they're just checking it out. That's how much time you have to get their attention. So even the point of that study was not to serve humanity to help us. It was to help corporations to get more, you know, to be smart enough to get what they want at the moment. You know, all these corporations, their eye detection, what they do is that when they look at all these websites that they actually, corporations that they have the money, they bring people, they even, some of them are being paid. Come, check this website, test it. And they follow your eyes movement on the page 
Okay, and then there is a map of that, the heat signature kind of, that okay, everybody who came, 100 people, when they went to this website, they just, you know, most of them focus on the right side in the middle on this part. So your action item has to be there. They study our behavior, they even study all the way to our eye movement. They know exactly what they want. You know, whenever you see free services such as Instagram or Facebook or all these platforms, none of them do it qurbatan in Allah for the sake of God to serve humanity. None of them. They're a corporation, they look for profit. They're here to make money. I'm not saying that, you know, they shouldn't. They offer a service, but don't be gullible. Don't be naive, thinking that, okay, they don't want anything from me. Our data is being sold. There are, literally, there are offers being made to the highest bidder for our personal data, including that what are we checking, our interests, our dislikes, our likes. So sabr and patience in Quran is a virtue that Allah gives to the one that he loves. But we need to develop patience. How we do it? Let me kind of skip all of them. In what aspects of life we need patience, by the way? According to Quran, we need patience, number one, when it comes to our socialization. Wasbir ala ma yaqulun, Quran said. Be patient when you talk to people. If you want to be a person who go to any kind of circle, you have a circle of friends, you have co-workers, networking, you need to be patient if you want to be successful. And if you look at all these books about leadership, one thing they will tell you is a good leader is the one who listens good. A good leader is the one who doesn't speak first, he's the one who speaks last, because he listens. And in order to speak last, you need to be patient. For the sake of dunya and akhira, we need to develop, cultivate patience. We need it. It's for the success of this life and hereafter. Impatient people, people who are ajal, they're in rush, they make bad decision in business, they make bad decision in marriage, they make bad decision in parenting, and of course they make bad, parent, bad decisions about the akhira and hereafter as well. Sabr. So one about interaction with others, socialization. Sabr in education, to learn, and we need to be patient. You know, last night, alhamdulillah, I, I followed, I, I asked someone, and also I looked at how long I, I gave a lecture, English, Farsi, and Musiba, all of them was over an hour. I was tired by the end of the time, and that doesn't happen that often, by the way. But one thing that I know is that Sometimes people want short versions. Can we keep it short? We can. But no matter how much you keep it short, when it comes to education, you need patience. If you go to school, universities, you need to sit down. You need to listen to the teacher for the time being. All due respect to all the TikTok lovers here, TikTok cannot replace education. It's good to motivate you, inspire you, but it cannot give you an in-depth knowledge of anything. Everything has to be in a short version. So in education and learning, we need to be patient as well. In tarbiyah, upbringing, we need patience. Dear parents who ask me for a dua to magically fix the problem, it doesn't exist. The student that you're asking me in the night of your test for a magical dua to fix your lack of a study, it doesn't exist. There's a proper way for everything. So in a matter of tarbiyat of your children, raising them well, you need to be patient. Don't look for a quick result. You send your children after four, or let's say after two months of Saturday school, you expect them to be Ayatollah or Molana. Be patient. Work has to be done. People say, you know, I prayed 
but I cannot focus. People said, I cannot wake up for Fajr. You need to be patient. For 40 days, wake up for Fajr. Then come to me. After 40 days of consecutive waking up for your Fajr, come to me if you still have trouble waking up for Fajr. You won't. Our body circadian rhythm is going to adapt. 40 days. Consistent. It's about patience. But how we develop patience? Before I say that, to know that it's possible to develop patience. Imam al-Hassan we have somebody came from Sham. He's a man that all his life he heard the propaganda of Muawiyah. So he asked, who is this man? He pointed to Imam Hassan. He said, he is Hassan, son of Ali. And he started cursing Imam Ali after his shahadat. Imagine, God forbid, somebody curse our dead father. Cursing Imam Ali salam and cursing Imam Hassan. Say whatever he was worthy of to Imam. And after he finished, Imam let him finish venting all his anger. What Imam Hassan told him. He said, I think you're a stranger in this town. I think you're a traveler. I think you are, again, you, you don't know who we are. You don't know this town. But if you are in need of help, come. If you, have a, if you don't have a place to stay, come. We provide you shelter. Come be our guest for food. The exchange of all that hatred was the offer of kindness of Imam Hassan alayhi salam. That if you are here and you are you know, looking for selling a debt, come to us. What do you need? Tell us. And at the end of that conversation, that Shami person, that person from Sham, he said, when I came to the city of Medina, if you would have asked me who are the worst people on earth, I would say Hassan and Ali alayhi salam. But now I will leave a town telling you the best of people on earth are these two people. That's sabr. If you lose your temper and go after someone who's ignorant, you cannot change people. So you may say that's imam. How about average people? I give you one story. Mullah Mahdi al Naraqi. There is a famous book of akhlaq about ethics. If you ask any scholar or any well learned person, they know about Mi'raj al Sa'ada, the collector of uh, happiness or eloquence. Mi'raj al Sa'ada. Sorry, Jami'u Sa'adat is the book of Mullah Mahdi Naraqi. He wrote this book on akhlaq. He categorized them well. It's a very good book. At his time, scholars of the time, they admired the hard work of Mullah Mahdi Naraqi. And he lives in Iran. He wrote the book. And among the ulama of the time, Sayyid Mahdi Bahrul Uloom, a great scholar in Najaf, read the book and he said, one of my greatest dream, you know, wishes is to meet the author of this book, Mullah, Mullah Mahdi Naraqi. After a while, Mullah Mahdi Naraqi went to Najaf for ziyarat. When he came to ziyarat of Imam Ali alayhi salam, all the scholars, that was tradition of the time, when a scholar would visit, the people who are the host basically, the resident, would come to visit the traveler. So all the scholars of Najaf came to visit Mullah Mahdi al-Naraqi. Except Sayyid Mahdi al-Bahr al Except him. Everybody was shocked. We thought that he wanted to meet him. And now that he's here, he didn't even come to visit him in Najaf. So we have that Mullah Mahdi Naraqi asked the address of Sayyid Bahr al -Urum. He went to visit him. And as he entered and greeted everyone, Sayyid Bahr al -Urum showed him a cold shoulder, did not really acknowledge his, his presence. People's surprise was even more. What happened? Why Sayyid is doing this? He was the one who admired the book and the author. But Mullah Mahdi Naraqi showed his respect, greeted him and left without showing any kind of anger, sadness, disappointment, nothing. After a few days, he came back again to visit Sayyid Bahr al-Ulum. Again, cold shoulder from Sayyid Bahr al-Ulum. 
And everybody's surprised. All the other scholars are surprised. This is not, you know, the type of person Sayyid Barul Rum is. What's going on? Why well, doesn't honor him the way he should? And again, Mullah Naraqi greeted him, sat down, and left without be getting upset. And it went until the day he wanted to leave Najaf and go back and return to his home. So Mullah Naraqi, for one last time for farewell, came to visit Sayyidah Bahrul Ulum. But this time, Sayyidah Bahrul Ulum stood up, honored him, greeted him, showed the respect that was all time due. And then they asked him, why? Why not the first two times? Why now? And Sayyidah Bahrul Ulum said, please don't do this to others. This is Sayyidah Bahrul Ulum. He's the scholar at the time. He knows. This is not a, st a story to be replicated, by the way. Because, you know, those who do this kind of test, they know. So he said, the reason I did that was when I r read the book, which is all about akhlaq. It's about, you know, the chapters on forbearance, patience, helm, sabr. I said, let me test the author that how much he himself is someone who exercised what he wrote. And now I know the man who wrote it is the one who first uphold those values and he wrote it. So there are ulama and scholars who showed it. And there are more stories to be said. It's possible to develop patience. But the same way the word patience is, to develop and cultivate patience takes time. There is no way that overnight you become a patient person. If you have short temper, if you have anger issues, it's not a matter of one night, a month, or a year. It's a matter of years of hard work to improve small step at a time. What to do? Step number one, admit that there is impatience in you. Admission of the problem. insan min ajal. To understand that we are, our nature is in rush and haste is a first step. For somebody to pretend that I don't have patience issue. You know, Sheikh, you don't know. It's not my problem. People are pushing my buttons. It's not my problem. My family are really annoying. They really bother me. That is shifting the blame, not acknowledging that we have impatience problem. Admission is the first step. Acknowledgement of the problem that I need to develop patience. Step number two, which is very important, is to practice patience in small mundane activities. Small actions that make us more patient. For example, in Islam, it's highly recommended and mustahab to do gardening. To work with the nature with trees, with flowers. Why? One of the reasons, of course, is about the nature, is natural, is connect you with the earth, it connects you, you know, with soil that we're created for, all that good. But one of the reasons when you do gardening is not about the speed. You cannot just plant a seed and magically next day you have a flower or magically you have a tree. One thing that gardening teaches us is be patient. It takes time. Reading instead of watching movies and TV shows. It's a good practice of mundane activities that develop patience. Visual stimulus is make us impatient. We want to see everything in a matter of two hours. But when you read a book, it takes much longer. And then you do the work. You do the imagination. That helps with development of patience. Do small things over time. Don't look for shortcuts. You know, sometimes people always look for a way to summarize, to look at the short version, abstract. Something you need to push yourself to go with full version. And the third and last step, again based on my time that I have, to develop and cultivate patience is to Read and study Quran and the life of Prophet and his family. We need inspiration from those who are examples of patience. 
When you sit in the majalis of Imam al-Husayn how can we hear the name Zainab and not be inspired by the concept of patience? You know, I remember a sister years ago came to me in a masjid and said, you know, Mulana, I made a dua. I have some problem in my life. And I made the wasita, the connection between me and Allah, to be Abu al-Fadl Abbas alayhi salam. And I told Allah, Ya Allah, if my hajat, my demand is not answered, I will not even one more time, I will not even come to the majlis of Abu al-Fadl Abbas again. And I look at this, I said, okay, do you want me to admire you? What is that? If you don't come to these majalis, who's the one who loses? It's like you are threatening someone to hurt yourself. And you're asking Allah by the sake of a man, al lillah wa li rasuleh. He was the one who was fully obedient to Allah and to the Messenger of Allah and to the Ahlul Bayt. You ask him to do something that Allah doesn't want. We need to learn from Quran. We need to learn from the Ahlul Bayt. Because if we lose that sight and we compare ourselves with people who are less patient than us, what, come, what happens? We settle for the lowest common denominator, right? Oh, I'm more patient than many people. At least when I lose my temper, I don't hit anyone. And I feel that I, you know, because I'm just physically abusive, that's a great honor. Because I'm verbally abusive, not physically abusive. That's not the lowest standard we should uphold ourselves to. How we can read the story of Malik al-Ashtar and how we control his anger. How we can read the sabr of the companions of Ahlul Bayt, ulama, and think, okay, this is okay for me. So in summary, the art of patience, mastering the art of patience, it comes when number one we understand that there is an issue of impatience in our society. It's getting worse and worse every day. Technology is unfortunately is intensifying the situation. And the solution to that, as I said, there are few steps we can take in order to develop and cultivate patience, which inshallah Allah grant all of us that tawfil. And make this dua. Okay, we do all those steps as well. We, these are the practical lessons. But of course, don't forget the value of dua. In order to ask Allah for increasing our patience, one dua is Rabbi Shrahli Sadri. You can look it up as in Quran, Surah Taha, Dua of Musa alayhi salam. The second one is this Dua, Rabbana Afrig alayna sabra, is also from Quran. Wathabbit aqdamana. Ya Allah, grant, grant us and bless us with being able to be among the patient one and to help our steps to be firm. Help us to hold on to what's right. Amin ya Rabbal Alameen. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So be patient a few minutes, inshallah, with Farsi speech. I'll keep it, inshallah, short as well. Bara Farsi dashtam, as kalam piyambar, nigaw mi kardam, حدیثی است که پیغمبر فرمود آیا شبیه ترین مردم رو به خودم به شما معرفی کنم چه خواسته ای از این بالاتر که ما شبیه پیامبر باشیم و دعایی که در زیارت عاشورا میگیم اللهم اجعل محیا یا محیا محمد و آل محمد و مماتی ممات محمد و آل محمد خدایا زندگی ما روش زندگی ما بر مسیر پیامبر و آل پیامبر باشد مرگ ما هم در اون مسیر باشد حالا سوال این است که چه کسی مثل پیامبر زندگی میکنند کلام خود پیامبر رو بشنویم به امیر علی علیه السلام فرمود فرمود یا علی
الا اخبركم باشباهكم بی خلقن علی جان آیا شبیه ترین مردم از لحاظ خلق و رفتار رو به خودم معرفی کنم قال بلا یا رسول الله امین المؤمنین فرمود بله یا یا رسول الله قال احسنکم خلقا فرمود او کسی که از همه شما اخلاقش نیکوتر باشد حسن خلق بعضی نمیفهمن حسن خلق چی از سوال میکنن یعنی چی حسن خلق فقط به معنی لبخند زدن و خندیدن نیست حسن خلق تعریفی که خود پیامبر ازش کرده است که فرمود انی بعث لاتمم مکارم الاخلاق فرمود حسن خلق این است که اگر کسی به تو ظلم کرد عفو کنه ببخشی ارحم ترحم این حسن خلق بعضی کینه این 20 سال پیش در عروسی کاری شده است 20 سال راه نمی کند 20 سال از راه نمی کند فرمود این که انسان از کسی که به تو بدی میکنه در گذاری یعنی حسن خلق این حسن خلق پیانبر یعنی مکارم الاخلاق با او کسی که با تو قطع رابطه کرده است تو رابطه برقرار کنی تو اتصال بکنی نه او کسی که خانه تو آمده است تو جواب آمدن او رو بدهی رفت او رو آمد کنی فرمود او کسی که قطع رابطه کرده است تو با او دوباره رفت آمد بکنه این فرمود این یعنی مکارم الاخلاق یعنی حسن خلق سوم فرمود او کسی که وقتی تو نیازمند بودی تو رو محروم کرده است وقتی دست تو تنگ بوده است دست رد به سینه تو زده است او شخص رو تو کمک کنه وقتی نوبت تو رسید فرمود این یعنی حسن خلق و الله هل جزا و الاحسان الا الاحسان حسن خلق نیست او خلق است یا وقت از ما جواب خوبی رو با خوبی می دهیم این شاهکار نکردیم قرآن میگه هل جزا الاحسان الا الاحسان آیا جواب نیکی جز نیکی است پس حسن خلق اخلاق نیکو این است که کسی که به تو بدی کرده از خوبی کنه آسان نیست برای این است که پیغمبر فهم بود شبیه ترین مردم به من کسی است که حسن خلق دارد این یک دوم و اعظم و کم حلمن او کسی که بردباری او شکیبایی او تحمل او از همه زیادتر است بالاتر است کسی که هر کی بهش زخم زبان بزند تنه بزند تحملش بالاست فرمود او به من از همه نزدیکتر است هر چه تحمل و طاقت انسان در مقابل جهل دیگران نادانی دیگران زیادتر به همو اندازه به پیغمبر نزدیکتر و ابر رو کن به قرابته و او کسی که از همه نسبت به خیشان و نزدیکان و دوروبریاش نیکو کارتر است بر به معنی نیکی او کسی که میگم به فکر قمخار همه هست خب بعضی ها متاسفانه این ذهنشون میرسد آقا ما قم همه رو خوردیم روزی که ما خود ما مشکل دار شدیم کسی به فکر ما نبود یاد ما نرود که برای خدا کار کردن با شرایط نیست که خدای ما برای تو کار میکنیم یعنی به او کسی هم که حتی بدی میکند خوبی میکنیم او حتی اگر قدر نداند پیش تو گم نمیشود فمن یعمل مثقال ذرتن خیرن یر از ذر ذر خوبی و بدی نزد خدا محفوظ است ما با یه وقت ناامید بشیم فرض کنید شما صدقه جمع میکنید روان میکنید افغانستان یک دست شما درد نکنم به شما نمیگن یک چهار تا حرف هم میزنن نگو خوب ما دفعه اول آخر باشد کمک میکنیم مگه برای دست شما درد نکنه کمک کردیم مگر الگوی ما سوره انسان اهل بیت نیستن فهم قل لا اسألكم علیه اجران الا المودت فی القربا ای قربا و اهل بیت بیامر چه کسانی بودن لا نورید و منکم جزاء ولا شکورا امیر المومین فاطمه زهر و سلام الله علیه ما وقتی اونها و افتاری خودشون رو با یتیم و مسکین و اسیر تقسیم کردن چی گفتن؟ ما هیچ توقعی از شما نداریم ولو توقع یک شکور و تشکری هم از شما نداریم اینما نطعیم کم لوجه الله ما برای خدا کردیم بنده خدا هم تشکری نکند 
پدر و مادر عزیزی که زحمت اولاد رو میکشی اولاد شما قد نشناس نیست انشالله که هیچ اولاد قد نشناسی نباشد ولی نگیم خدایا تمام زحمت های ما به هدر رفت ما یه هم زحمت کشیدیم ای طفل ما ای فرزند ما اولاد ما نمک شناسیز نباشد زحمت شما برای خدا طول شما اولاد بزرگ کردی ولا او اولاد قد شناس نباشد پیش خدا گم نمیشود و آخری فرمود و اشد کم من نفسی انصافا او کسی که انصاف با انصاف ترین شما به من پیغمبر از همه شبیه تر است نزدیک به پیغمبر شبیه پیغمبر با انصاف از انصاف ما قدیمی ها میگفتن یک سوزن به خود بزن یک جوالدوزی به مردم اگه اینا رو نشنیدن الان میگه یعنی که اگر قبل از اینکه کاری رو در حق دیگران انجام بدی بپرس اگر اگر کسی کار رو در حق تو بکند آیا تو راضی هستی یا نه یعنی انصاف آنچه برای خود میپسندی برای دیگران هم بپسند آنچه برای خود نمیپسندی برای دیگران هم نپسند اگر شما عروس داری یک زمان خود شما عروس بودی دوست داری دوست داشتی زمانی که شما عروس بودی خوشوی شما مادر خانم مادر شوهر با شما چنین برخورد کنند انصاف شما شوهری یا همسری پرسان کن همین سوال رو بپرس من خسته از سر کار میام اگر من میامدم دوست داشتم با من این برخورد بشود یا خانم هم زحمت بکشد انصاف از اگر ما این هم زحمت میکشیم اینجور جواب زحمت رو بدیم اگر انصاف بود چقدر دردهای خانواده های ما کم میشد چقدر گله ها شکایت ها قرزدن های بی جای مرد ها و زن ها کم میشد انصاف انشالله که ما هدف ما این باشد الگوی ما پیامبر باشد و خدا ان شاءالله ما رو شبیه پیامبر در مسیر زندگی پیامبر قرار بدهد خدا ان شاءالله همه ما خلق ما رفتار ما رو خلق و رفتار محمدی قرار بدهد السلام علیک یا ابا عبد الله و علی الارواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله ابدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله اخر العهد مني لزيارتكم everyone together السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب زيارة الناهية المقدسة از إمام الزمان عجل الله تعالى فرج الشريف چند جملة از زبان إمام الزمان روزه بخانيم جملاتي از كين چنين امام زمان عجل الله تعالی فرج و شریف ازاداری جدش سید و شهده را کرده است رفع علی القنا رأسک و صبی اهلک کالعبید سلام بر تو ای حسینی که صدت رو بر نیزه کردن سلام بر تو حسینی که خانواده ات رو مثل اسیران به بند کشیدن رفع علی القنا رأسك و سبی اهلک کالعبید و صفدو فی الحدید فوق اقتاب المطیعات ای هلال من به بالای سنان قرآن بخوان قاری قرآن و قرآن را زبان قرآن بخوان با صدای خود مسخر کن تمام کوفران 
کوفر هم کربلا کن همچنان قرآن بخوان و سبیا اهل کل عبید خانوادت رو مانند بندگان اسیر کردن و صفدو فی الحدید فوق اقتاب المطیات با زنجیرهای آهنین به بند کشیدن بر روی مرکبهای بدون جهاز سوار نمودن تلف حوجوه هم حر الهاجرات یساقون فی البراری والفلوات صورتهای اونها رو آفتاب سوزان سوزان اونها رو در دشتها و سهراها میراندن ایدیهم مغلولتون الالاعناق دستهاشون رو به گردنهاشون بسته بودن یطاف بهم فی الاسواق اونها رو در بازارها میچرخاندن نقل است از امام باقر علیه السلام وقتی آوردن ای اوسرها رو از داخل بازار شام عبور دادن ای دشمنانی که از پشت بام از, از, از همه جا از اطراف آماده بودن ادهیشون مشغول پایکوبی و شادی کردن ادهی با سنگ به سرهای شهدا بر روی نیزه ها داریم ام, ام کلسوم سلام الله علیه ها درخواست کرد از شمر ملعون ای شمر تو کسی هستی که با مردهای ما آنچه کردی که خدا می داند حد اقل ما رو از بین بازار عبور نده نگذار چشم این نامهرمان به این کودکان و دختران بیفتد شمر ملعون برعکس آوردند اسرا رو از بین بازار شام عبور دادند راستی از سر بازار خبر داری که هر کسی خواست به ما چشم تماشا انداخت حلقه جمعیت چشم چرانهای حسون اما را در وسط معرکه تنها انداد امام باقر می فرماید لما قدم علا یزید به ذرار الحسین ادخل بهن نهارا مکشوفات وجود فرمود امام باقر وقتی اهل بیت با عبدالله رو بر یزید وارد کردن صورتهای اونها باز بود بعضی ها هجاب معجر رو از سر گرفته بودن ایشامیان جفاکار فقال اهل الشام الجفاد ما رأینا سبیا احسن منها اولا فمن انتم امام زمان کلام امام باقر است یاد ما نرود اهل بیت غیرت الله هستند ایشامیان صدا زدند ما اسیرانی زیباتر از اینها ندیدیم شما چه کسی هستید فقال سکین بنت الحسین نحن سبایا آل محمد سکین بنت حسین فرمود ما اسیران اهل بیت محمدیم ما اسیران اترت پیغمبریم پرد پوشان حریم داوریم در مجلس شراب یزید داریم زینب بلند شد ای یزید از خدا حیا نمی کنی زنان و کودکان حسین اهل بیت پیامبر در مقابل چشم نامهرمان وقتی که زنهای تو در پشت پرده ها در امنیت باشن آقا امام سجاد علیه السلام او خطبه نورانی رو فرمود 
آوردن اونها رو در خراب جا دادن مصیبت رقیه رو خواندم اما بخوانم ادامش رو در مقتل ها نوشتن در تاریخ آمده از وقتی که شهادت رقیه سلام الله علیه ها وقتی به شهادت رسید این زنان و کودکان نالشون بلند شد تا قبلش رقیه گریه می کرد برای حسین گریه می کردن. اما وقتی بدن بی جان رقیه روی زمین افتاد این زنان و کودکان ام کلسوم زینب همه شروع کردن نال زدن یزید صدا زد مگر نگفتم اینها رو آرام کنید باز چرا گریه میکنن گفتن یکی از این اطفال از دنیا رفته دزدور داد به این سرباز ها گفت برین اینها رو ساکت کنید آمدن با تازیانه آمدن با زیلی این زنان و کودکان رو که چرا گریه میکنید ساکت باشید این مصیبت چه کرد با زینب وقتی که آوردن زینب رو رسید به مدینه عبدالله ابن جعفر آمد دنبال زینب هرچه داخل ای کاروان گشت زینب رو پیدا نکرد یه زن قد خمیده یه زرزفید رو دید سوال کرده ای بانو آیا زینب بنت علی رو دیدید؟ صدای او زن بلند شد جعور عبدالله ابن جعور عبدالله بایدم زینب رو نجنازی آخه زینبی که از مدین رفت برادر داشت زینبی که از مدین رفت رقیه همراه او بود زینبی که از مدین رفت اینقدر تازیانه و زیلی نخورده بود باید زینب رو نجنازی ولا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينغلبون إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون يا الله by the honor of Zainab sallamullah alayha haste and return of Imam of our time Imam sahib al-Asr wa zaman by the honor of Abu Abdullah and Hussein alayhi salam, grant all of us ziyarat of Ahlul Bayt in this dunya and their shafa'at in the day of judgment. Ya Allah, by the honor of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, all the mazlumin, all the oppressed in the world, especially the oppressed people of Afghanistan, Ya Allah, provide them with immediate relief. Ya Allah, by the honor of Abu Abdullah and Hussein alayhi salam, all the marid, all those who are ill, immediately grant them immediate shifa, healing, remedy, and recovery. By the honor of Abu Abdullah Hussein, from this majlis, send a gift, a thawab, to the soul of all of our marhumin, especially the marhumin that we mentioned their names at the beginning. Ya Allah, grant them maghfirat and forgiveness. Allahumma maghfir lana wa li walidayna wa li waliday walidayna wa li man lahu haqqun alayna wa li jamiya al-mu'minin wa al-mu'minat rahimallah li man qara al-fatiha ma'as-salawad.